is Taylor and welcome to the third edition of my poetry series. As requested by one of you absolute lovelies, this week's episode is John Montague. John Montague had a troubled childhood, similar enough to the majority of poets on this course. Apparently family problems fuels creativity. His mommy issues stem from his mother's relentless teasing about him being born wrong in two ways. Not only did she want a girl, but she also wanted her vagina to survive the birthing process. And for poor, innocent John Montague, being born the wrong sex and the wrong way around had him left in less than favorable light in his mother's eyes. The daddy issues stem from his father's drinking problem and excessive racism, and the overall parental issues were caused by the poverty that surrounded and eventually consumed their love. His parents divorced when he was young and sent him to live with his aunts in Ireland. The time he spent there fuels much of his poetry. Most of Montague's poetry revolves around the themes of childhood memories, love he experiences growing up in the age of sexual liberation, and the family life that left him haunted as an unwanted child. Now that the backstory is out of the way, let's get started. Let us start with Killing the Pig. BTW, I am so sorry to all the vegans out there, I did not write this poem. <laughs> The poem Killing the Pig has a theme of cruelty, and although emotional cruelty wrecked Montague's life, the cruelty depicted is not his own, but rather animal cruelty. The poem describes the horror of killing the farm's pig, and reflects the ear-piercing protests of the terrified animal using musical effects. The most common musical effects portrayed in this poem are assonance and sibilance. You will see so bloody much of that throughout this poem. Carefully chosen words are used to create a piercing sound similar to that of the pig's. Squealing, an iron cleek sunk in the roof of his mouth. The repetition of the I and K conveying the echoing sounds. In the second stanza, Montague uses sibilance, will not go dumb or singing to the slaughter, to convey the shrieking of the pig as it is dragged off to die. In the next lines, I is repeated. That high-pitched, final effort, as well as sibilance. No single sound could match it. Following that is vivid imagery used to appeal to our sense of hearing and convey the sound of the pig. A big plane roaring off. A diva soaring towards her final note. The brain-chilling persistence of an electric saw. Scrap being crushed. Many times throughout this poem, I is repeated as an example of assonance. Used to convey the high-pitched screams of the tortured animal. Piercing. An absolute. Only high heaven ignores it. A change in sound quality comes in the third to last stanza, in which the shrieking of the animal comes to an end. Then, a full stop, a solid thump of the mallet. This can be sharply contrasted to the above stanzas. The sibilance and repetition of I returning convey the slicing of knives along the pig's dead body. Swiftly the knife seeks the throat, swiftly the other cleavers work, till the carcass is hung up, shining and eviscerated the stanza ending on the simile as a surgeon's coat. The final stanza ends on a lesson Montague has learned from watching the pig be killed. The walls of the farmyard still hold that scream, are built around it. Meaning, the farm is built off of money, created by the killing and torturing of an animal that did no harm. Montague felt so incredibly guilty that the memory haunted him. From childhood until his adult years, a poem similar to Killing the Pig is The Trout, that shares the theme of animal cruelty as well as childhood memories. Through reading poems like these, you become aware of Montague's view that the natural world is a cruel and frightening one. The Trout opens with a line of assonance. Flat on the bank I parted rushes, and a stanza of vivid descriptions of the fish. He lay, tender light, in his fluid sensual dream. These lines also contain the metaphor of the fish dreaming, imagery and both assonance and alliteration used to convey the mysteriousness of the trout in the water. Montague was totally showing off. <laughs> the second stanza begins with an indication that Montague is becoming enthralled with his power over the aquatic creature, comparing himself to almost godlike. Bodiless lord of creation. The following lines include sibilance. Savoring my own absence, senses expanding in the slow motion, and vivid descriptions. The photographic calm that grows before actions. Both of these poetic techniques make this poem cinematic, the precise writing making it appear movie-like. 
The third stanza contains another example of the personification of the fish that is rampant throughout this poem. As the curve of my hand swung under his body, he surged with visible pleasure, suggesting the fish can feel pleasure for being caught. The final stanza is similar to the final stanza of Killing the Pig. The line, I gripped, is a sudden statement, perfectly portraying a sudden action. The final line contains alliteration of the letter T. To this day, I can taste his terror on my hands. The guilt and compassion Montague has for the fish is comparable to the feelings he had for the pig. A poem that also contains an appreciation for the natural world is Wind Harp. The sounds of Irish countryside and the loneliness of a solitary person surrounded by them are conveyed through the musical poetic effects throughout. In this poem, the poet carefully chooses his words to create patterns and pictures like a painter creating art. Such an example of this is the sibilance in the first few lines. The sounds of Ireland, seeping out of low bushes. This is repeated again further down the poem. Scraping tree branches, light hunting cloud, sound hounding light, which is also an example of assonance, the repetition of OU, drawing out the vocal loneliness of the scenery. A wonderful example of a phrase with two meanings is that restless whispering you never get away from. This is a personification of the wind, but also a comment on country Irish people's gossiping. And from somebody who lives in the rurals, I gotta say it's not wrong. <laughs> the poem is chocked full of vivid descriptions and nature imagery. The low bushes and grass, heather bells and ferns, wrinkling bog pools. A use of personification is present near the middle of the poem in which a cloud floating across the sky is described as light hunting cloud. Then it is used again to describe wind sweeping over the land. A hand ceaselessly combing and stroking the landscape. The poem ends on a simile, the valley gleams like the pile upon a mountain pony's coat, ending optimistically as the sun shines, despite the lonely tone throughout. Beginning Montague's poems of relationships, we have The Locket, that describes his problematic relationship with his mother. Another theme present is poverty, and the overall tone is regretful. The poem begins with the lines, Sing a last song for the lady who is gone, conveying Montague's regret through the finality of her death. Although Montague regrets his lack of a relationship with his mother, he is also honest with the subtle bitterness still residing in him. His mother was his fertile source of guilt and pain, and had no visual empathy for the guilt she caused him, stating that his was the worst birth in the annals of Brooklyn. Such examples of Montague's feelings about being an unwanted child are scattered throughout the poem. He describes how, naturally, she longed for a girl, bloody bloody blue, he came out both the wrong sex and the wrong way round not readily forgiven. Montague goes on to describe his difficult family life, quoting his mother. When poverty comes through the door, love flies up the chimney. The fourth stanza begins with a matter-of-fact statement directed at his mother. Then you gave me away, suggesting a bitterness that he later overcame and grew to forgive her for. I had cycled down to court you like a young man. Despite showing bitterness toward the woman who walked out on him, Montague also shows sympathy towards her. He shows sympathy toward her miserable life from the belle of her small town to ending up a mournful and chill woman. He felt sorry for her as she was emotionally vacant in order to protect her feelings from the pain of losing her family again. He uses direct speech and quotes to properly convey her pain. Don't come again, you say roughly. I start to get fond of you, John, and then you are up and gone. The poem ends with an example of symbolism. Although he doesn't discover it until she's dead, he learns of an oval locket with his baby picture inside that she wore around her neck. This locket is a symbol of his mother's hard-to-grasp love. A poem similar to The Locket is The Cage, describing the problematic patriotic relationship he had with his father. The overall tone of this poem is negative, using depressing language to convey the themes of poverty, loss of a relationship, and the loss of a life. The poem begins with a dramatic and direct statement. My father, the least happy man I have known. He goes on to describe his father as having a face retaining the pallor of those who work underground. 
his father's pale complexion being from a lack of sunshine, and sunshine being a metaphor for happiness, further encouraging the idea that he was a miserable man. Two examples of depressing language appear in the first stanza. The lost years in Brooklyn, encouraging the idea that his father lived a wasted life, and a subway shudder the earth, an automatopoeia word with two meanings. One being the rattling of the train, and the other being to shiver due to unpleasantness. The poem is in a narrative style, using free verse and emphasizing the last lines of each stanza to set an appropriate tone. The second stanza emphasizes his father's alcohol problem and the drowning of his emotions using neat whiskey that he drank until he reached the only element he felt at home in any longer. Brute oblivion. Despite his addiction, his father continued to pick himself up most mornings to march down the street, which is also an example of alliteration. Despite his father's addiction, Montague continued to attempt a relationship with him, much like he did with his mother. He forgave him for contributing to his abandonment, and when he came back to Ireland, they walked across fields of Garvahi, using alliteration of H's to emphasise the contrast of the Irish countryside to the hell-like underground in Brooklyn. To see Hawthorne on the summer hedges as though he had never left. The second to last stanza uses a mythical story from the Trojan era to describe the lack of a relationship between them. When weary Odysseus returns, Telemachus must leave. Having lived apart for so many years, they are practically strangers. We did not smile in the shared comple comple complicity. Why was that so hard for me to say? <laughs> of a dream for they had nothing in common. The final stanza switches to present tense as he describes the haunting memory of his dead father that continues to plague him to this day. I see his bald head behind the bars of the small booth. Using assonance, he states the final lines. The mark of an old car accident, beating on his ghostly forehead. Another poem with the theme of relationships is All Legendary Obstacles. The theme of this poem is love and the tone is anxious. Such things are conveyed through musical effects and detailed descriptions. The poem begins with a description of the geographical and cinematic obstacles of America. Montague's lover had to cross on the train in order to get to him. Using alliteration of M, assonance of I, onomatopoeia of the word hissing, and personification of the mountains as villainous and evil. The long imaginary plain, the monstrous ruck of mountains, and, swinging across the night, flooding the Sacramento, a hissing drift of rain, winter rain. The second stanza emphasizes the nervous tone as he waits for her to arrive. All day I waited, shifting nervously, as I saw another train sail. Vivid descriptions follow, including alliteration, water dripping from great flanged wheels. Relief of her arrival appears in the third stanza as suddenly as she does. At midnight, you came. I was too blind with rain and doubt to speak. The climax of the poem appears when their chilled hands met, a symbolic act of their love. To convey the joy of them reuniting, as well as the sound of their lips meeting, Montague uses sibilance in the final lines. We move into the wet darkness, kissing still unable to speak. Another poem with the theme of love and relationships is The Same Gesture, an erotic poem that suggests a secret romance. An example of such secrecy surrounding the relationship appears in the very first line. There is a secret room of golden light. When describing the feelings felt in such a room, he uses words such as love, violence, hatred as possible, and again love. This language conveys the passion of the relationship. In the second stanza, Montague describes the coming together of body and mind in harmony, blocking out the cruelty of the world. Such intimacy of hand and mind is achieved under its healing light. The tone of this poem is erotic and romantic, conveying through the metaphor, shifting of hands is a rite like court music, describing their intimacy as almost like a sacrament. Kind of weird in my opinion, but I mean... The third stanza reinforces the idea that the poet is having sex suggesting that they both lose themselves in the act, as they are naked to one another, physically, spiritually, and mentally. We barely know ourselves. It is what we always were, mostly nakedly are. 
In the fourth stanza, the outside world intrudes on the couple's intimacy. They are forced into resuming our habits with our clothes, work, phone, drive through late traffic. The mentioning of lateness also suggesting a secrecy to the affair. The poem ends on the metaphor of driving a car as the act of intercourse. Changing gears with the same gesture has eased your snowbound heart and flesh. Montague, you are one weird motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Another feature of Montague's poems is character development through reminiscing over childhood memories. A poem fitting this description is The Wild Dog Rose, in which he uses vivid descriptions to convey the, de the development of a relationship between an elderly neighbouring woman and himself. The poem has a conversational tone throughout, setting a young Montague's opinion of this woman from the beginning, referring to her as a Kyluk, a witch. He describes her as having haunted his childhood, describing the eerie environment she abided in. The cottage circled by trees, weathered to a monitory shapes of desolation. Montague cleverly uses personification of the trees to convey the creepy feeling of the witch-like woman. The mountain winds straggle the trees into view. A beautiful use of metaphor and imagery describes the haggard old woman, a moving nest of shawls and rags. Following this, Montague vividly describes the horror of the elderly lady. The great hooked nose, the cheeks dew with dirt, the starring blue of the sunken eyes, the mottled claws clutching at a stick. However, now much older, Montague does not fear the old woman anymore, but now hold and return her gaze. Now that he is much older, he has made peace with the old woman. We talk in ease at last, like old friends, listening to her tell him stories. A particularly horrifying story shows the humanity behind a once terrifying woman. The vulnerability of the old lady describing her tragic story of sexual assault is a steep contrast to the evil witch he had described her as earlier. At the end of the poem, the woman explains how she has found comfort in religion. Whenever I see it, I remember the Holy Mother of God and all she suffered. The poem ends with the symbol of the wild dog rose as the beauty of the woman's faith crumbling yellow cup and pale bleeding lips fading to white at the rim of each bruised and heart-shaped petal. The flower is a symbol of the fragile beauty, but also it represents the woman, ancient, damaged, and vulnerable in her pain. The final Montague poem I will be discussing today is Like Dolmens Round My Childhood, The Old People. The world portrayed is a harsh and lonely one, with a macabre tone and sensuous imagery throughout. The themes are that of loneliness, isolation, and the realities of rural Ireland. The language is conversational and descriptive, as Montague describes his elderly neighbours as he leaves for college. The poem begins with the description of a friendly old man. He tipped me a penny every pension day, fed kindly crusts to winter birds, and despite his goodness, his home was robbed when he died. Only the corpse they didn't disturb. The poem is full of vivid descriptions of each individual neighbour. Despite some of them frightening him as a child, he has aged into compassion and emphasises with the reasons behind their personalities. She was a well of gossip, defiled, her lonely need to deride. He understood their situations. When describing the Neils, Montague uses many metaphors, alliteration and sparse language. He beautifully describes the blind men's garden, a hint of compassion because they couldn't see it themselves. Heather bells bloomed, clumps of foxglove, crickets chirped under the rocking hearthstone until the muddy sun shone out again. When describing Mary Moore, he economically describes her poverty-stricken life, driving lean cattle from a miry stable. He uses contrast between her appearance and her personality, as despite trampling through fields, she fell asleep to love stories. Proving the development of his compassion over the years, Montague describes the way the neighborhood children taunted Wild Billy Eagleson, showing an age sympathy for the lonely man, forsaken by both creeds. His Protestant family disowned him, whilst his wife's Catholic family refused his friendship also. In the second last stanza, Montague describes the trek doctors had to take in order to visit the elderly patients living in the remote rural parts of Ireland. Using alliteration and mythological stories of tribes, Montague dismisses the glamorized Irish stereotypes in favor of the reality. Ancient Ireland indeed, I was reared by her bedside. The rune and the chant, 
evil eye and averted head, Fomorian fierceness of family and local feud, gone figures of fear and of friendliness. For years they trespassed on my dreams, until once in a standing circle of stones. Finishing the poem off with the final lines, I felt their shadows pass into that dark permeance of ancient forms. He proves that he no longer has any fear for them. And there you go. That is my Montague video for you guys. Good luck to everyone who's doing their English exam in two weeks. Me too. God bless the lot of us. <laughs> and to everyone who's doing it next year, everybody who watches this video, even just for entertainment purposes, thank you all so, so very much. It means so very much to me that you guys come along on this very, very long process. These videos take actually weeks to write. And, oh, so much work, but it's always so worth it to hear you guys' sweet, sweet comments. You guys keep me going. I love you all so much. Mwah.